Hey there guys, Aaron here. Uh, so, I wanted... I spend a lot of my time uh, during the day looking up videos about science and philosophy, anarchy, capitalism, anarcho-capitalism, kindergartenism, uh, general science-y, knowledge-y stuff, you know, the dorkiest of the dork stuff, Carl Sagan, Stefan Molyneux, the really dorky stuff. Uh, but, and so often I'm running into lots of good content and stuff like that, and stuff I like to hear about. Uh, so whenever I make videos, I try to be as original as possible, as the old phrase goes, <clears throat> standing on shoulders of giants. Um, but I love reinterpreting data and bringing new ideas into good ethical theories and good philosophical theories and science and empiricism, all that sort of good stuff. And I wanted to talk tonight a little bit about um, the philosophy of anarchy capitalism and environmentalism and how the two will achieve solutions inside the environment of, um, of the ecosystem of the earth, right? How will these these political and economic uh, consequences impact the environment because that's something that we don't really talk much about. And one thing, I really wanted to touch on this as well as speciation. And I wanted to lead with speciation here and talk about total biodiversity to build up. I want to, of course, not just offer good arguments but uh, good evidence for what I believe. So if you look at a chart of speciation over time. You know, you get, of course, um, for the first, out of the four billion years of life, for the first, you know, during the uh, the Archean era and the, the beginnings of the emergence of RNA and, you know, like um, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, the basic uh, elements of life, which, of course, led to the archaea, the ancient bacteria with naked nucleus and all that stuff, and, of course, tiny, but then eventually you get the eukaryotic cell revolution with huge cells with massive organelles and a large rise in speciation around these, uh, these, this new uh, system. Of course, at some point, the emergence of the first cyanobacteria occurred, which, holy crap, who could have imagined what that would have done, you know? The, you could get a huge amount of oxygen uh, coming about from the first uh, emergence of the um, cyanobacteria, you get a huge, it's like, whoa, whoa, biodiversity going up, fantastic, right? So you could get the emergence of complex cells, and eventually, you know, plants would have emerged, and you'd get even more amounts of oxygen with a real huge photosynthetic revolution, but, but, but this is before plants, but uh, you get the Cambrian explosion, which is the result of the fact that now there was around 20% ambient oxygen, which means you could form massive quantities, finally, of collagen, which is the sort of, collagen is like the the molecular glue that cells use to bind themselves to each other, right? So if we didn't have collagen, we would just all of a sudden just go, and we'd fall to, you know, however many billions of atoms, uh, billions of cells, you know, just then those would eventually die, of course, very, well, quite rapidly, but anyway, that's beyond the... Uh, so, yeah, you get the emergence of the Cambrian explosion, just massive increases in biodiversity. Of course, you get um, the Permian-Triassic extinction, which is like 90% die and it's just like oh my gosh what a freaking extinction event that thing was you know when Pangea was like we're going to create one massive subversive duct and force all ton of lava into the center of the earth which then led to massive volcanism in the center of Pangea you know and so it's like everything dies including insects you know it's the only uh, extinction event where 53% of insects died so a massive drop in biodiversity then you know you go back up to the era of dinosaurs get huge amounts of biodiversity returning um uh, then you get the dinosaurs dying at the end of that, and that's a huge, like, 65, I can't remember how many genre pers uh, particular were lost, but it was a massive amount. And then um, you get, like, the Quaternary and the Paleo, uh, Cenozoic and stuff, and then you get, about 200,000 years ago, you get us who come out of the, the, the Homo genus, you know, like, Homo habilis is the first, but, you know, before that, like, um, possibly we had, I don't want to get too deep into it, because I want to get to capitalism and how this per permits for uh, to this thing. Uh, but, you know, we have the beginning of, like, um, of the Australopithecines, um, 
and then the Argopithecines before that with the human hip. I just I thought I really when this I heard blew my mind. I don't know if it, so it's random here, but I have to do tangents because I am known for my tangents every now and then. So here's the first tangent on this one. Uh, and the Argopithecines were uh, apparently the human hip preceded the evolution of the human foot, which is fantastic. It's like, okay, so we got the artipithecines, the uh, osteopithecines, we get into the homo genus, where you eventually evolve into, now I'm finally getting into us officially, let's get into us, baby, all right, homo sapiens. So then we get homo sapiens, and then about 80,000 years ago, something ridiculous happens to our genome, which is we get the emergence of the most important gene in all of life, uh, we get FOXP2 inside the human genome, and this allows us to speak finally, use symbolic language that all the chest muscles were there that had evolved through the lung muscles, all that stuff had evolved long before, and finally with the emergence, like people who can't speak or, who, or even write or c completely can't communicate, uh, they don't have FOXP2. If you don't have FOXP2, you can't talk and use symbolic language, and it so uh, revolutionized our species. Um, so now we had ethics, you know, we could talk about morality. And ethics is about an 80,000-year-old project, give or take, because of the emergence of Fox P2. And we've been trying to solve these problems about how to deal with the world. And we're finally almost there. You know, the Internet has really uh, supercharged ethics, I think. It's really allowed for that sort of um, Dawkins meme evolution to really turbocharge and ethics can finally start to work because of the internet which it's like sorry I love it. I use it all the time but sorry wheel you had it for the first 8,000 years um, but yeah the internet is just transforming society and so now what happened then is we started ethics inside ecology began and we began to talk about how we should do things and how we should exchange because see ethics doesn't happen in the realm of the rest of the animal kingdom you know, because there's no speech, and it doesn't happen. Like, you, there's no, how often does a lion watch a cheetah take down a gazelle, and they go, no, that belongs to that cheetah. You know, so it doesn't happen. But we, since we can have ethical discussions about ways that we trade and ways that we exchange property, because property is not existent in the animal kingdom, the only degree to which it's respected is the degree to which I'm bigger, and you aren't going to mess with me. So... When we finally began to universalize ethics, something astounding happened. Uh, biodiversity started to go up even more, and, and more and more and more. And this is the insane thing, is right when we started to get really good, like the found 200 years ago, the foundation of the American Republic, the closest thing to anarchy ever amongst the homo sapiens species, closest thing to capitalism ever in the animal kingdom. We do not come out of an evolutionary system which respects property rights, but we are capable of abstract thought and in speech, which has been given to us because of this one mutation 80,000 years ago. So we have better use these ethical systems to achieve universality and these sorts of things because it has profound impacts on the environment. Because what happened was, is it was like, straight up, like, we had a massive, the closest thing to anarchy, the closest thing to capitalism ever, led to the greatest rise of biodiversity in the history of history. Like, biodiversity has never been higher, ever, in four billion years. Out of 200? And it's, of course, what systems of ethics we use has an impact on the rest of the world and the environment. We are not, although ethics has kind of allowed us to feel separate from the ecosystem. Of course, we're connected to the environment and the ecosystem. We're just chemistry like the rest of it. And when we finally started to, to experiment with universality in these areas, with universality and liberty and universality, we didn't quite make it, though. And what happened beyond just not, beyond using a lack of universality in principles, <laughs> unfortunately, we weren't quite there when um, we hadn't quite achieved equality. We hadn't quite achieved universality and property rights with the American Republic. And so, since it was a flawed system, we had a massive increase in biodiversity, huge, like, when, when we're talking about respecting property rights, we're just, we have these natural consequences of increasing the efficiency of, like, the carbon cycle and tremendous stuff and all of, like, you know that old adage that capitalism lifts all boats? Well, anarchy capitalism will lift everything 
around us. Like capitalism isn't just good for human life on Earth. Capitalism is good for all life on Earth and all of the ecosystem and the environment benefits from the way that human beings, the rapport and the ethics that they use has a massive impact on the environment. And it's the tragedy of the commons, right? I mean, fundamentally. So if we don't respect, because we don't, because we weren't quite willing to toss the salad of capitalism, because we weren't quite willing to universalize property rights, and we, it, then, of course, we got, and, you know, a hundred years ago, the IRS and the Federal Reserve and everyone else in the world went for these massive idiocies and destroyers of life called central banks and income tax agencies. It's ridiculous. And what happens? Well, the interesting thing is it's like, closest thing to property rights ever. Rawr. And then it's like massive abridgments of property rights. And we are now in an, like, the, what happened? It was like, yay, no tragedy of the commons. And it's like, largest tragedies of commons you could possibly imagine in the form of fiat currency and the enormous theft fest that is called taxation. And because we were now using really bad principles, nature suffered. And we are now in an extinction event, the likes of which has not been seen since the... Like, the loss of the closest thing to capitalism, the loss of the closest thing to virtue and morality and ethics that we have ever achieved is now producing an extinction event greater than what is caused by a seven-mile-wide rock hitting the Earth at 200,000 miles an hour 65 million years ago. Like, a rock seven miles wide cannot produce an extinction event as great as the loss of virtue in the world and in philosophy. The closest thing to capitalism ever, yay! Oh, shit, income taxes and the Federal Reserve. And now all of nature is suffering because of what just happened. So... It's so important to talk about environmentalism when it comes to anarchy and capitalism because the like in the wa like water is so messed up because no one owns bodies of water or very rarely right um, and the oceans are the greatest tragedy of the commons ever I mean so many fisheries it's like if we actually had real ethical principles working in the oceans where people could buy up plots of the ocean and set up no fish zones. You have no legitimacy to come in here at all. This is a no fish zone. I own this and no one fishes here. And we'll finally be able to actually achieve sustainability inside the oceans because neither no one owns the so no one owns the oceans or the government owns the oceans. That's just as bad. So when we finally achieve absolute property rights in society where it's truly universal, again, reaching all the way from childhood to society at large, what will happen not just in our world, but in the whole ecosystem will be incredible. Of course, we will have biodiversity rises, the likes of which we would never have believed life capable of. I mean, we... Anarchy capitalism is a very environmental and impositive philosophy, especially when it comes to understanding our relationship with nature. Of course, that's kind of just what reason does, imagine that, right? But anyway, so love talking about environmentalism and all of its implications when it comes to politics and economics and all this stuff. And it's all interconnected, and that's why, and that's one of the reasons why I love these philosophies so very much, because they work so well together. Because, you know, the, our, our knowledge of chemistry should inform and enhance our knowledge for physics and, and physics should enhance biology and biology should enhance our understanding of ethics and, and all this stuff and build on it and stuff, you know, have diff beautiful interrelationships with our, uh, the basis for which we use knowledge, empiricism and rationality and, and virtue and, and integrity and honesty. So love talking about those things and all of their environmental consequences and uh, be part of the conversation and let it spread, baby, that capital just go crazy. Anyway, um, yay Earth and yay environmentalism. Uh, yay philosophy. Yay capitalism. Yay a world without any thieves. It's not like, what is the dream of anarchy capitalism? It's like, a world without thieves. Wouldn't that be great? Well, we have to try it once. You know, it'll be so obvious. And all of life on Earth will benefit from so little force 
in human societies. It will be massively wonderful for the entire ecosystem and for the whole planet, of which we're just a little bit of its chemistry, working out some magic on uh, on this rock orbiting this this star. So, rock philosophy. Have a good night, guys.